So nobody really does reviews of firearms training classes on YouTube, and I'm certainly not gonna be the first to kind of break into that territory because it'd be pretty dry. But I was able to sit down with Steve Anderson after taking his advanced two-day class, which is also where I got this really awesome farmer stand, and ask him some questions and kind of pick his brain. For those of you who aren't familiar with Steve Anderson, he's one of the people who basically put dry fire on the map in a practical shooting context. He's the proprietor of andersonshooting.com. He's written three books, and he travels around the country putting on practical shooting classes. Now, as far as this class is concerned, this was his advanced class. And what's kind of interesting about this class is it's not technique focused necessarily, but more of a how to compete kind of class, how to manage your expectations, how to manage your thinking, how to manage your effort to get the best performance out on the first run when it counts. And to that extent, I had some pretty huge takeaways from the class. I'm very well pleased. And I realize not everybody can spend the plus or minus 500 bucks that a class like this is gonna end up costing, but he does have some products that you can get into for significantly less. For instance, he's the host of That Shooting Show podcast, which is a practical shooting podcast, and he basically gives it away for free there. As well as his books, he's written three of them so far. All the links are in the description if you care to check them out. So the interview was after the second day of class where it was about 45 degrees, it was cold and damp, so give us a pass for any shivering you might see. And at the end of the video, I've got some snippets if it's lifted from class of some drills and the like that you might find interesting as well. The time codes are gonna be in the description if you wanna jump around. So that said, let's jump in. Just finished up the Steve Anderson advanced class. Here with Steve now, sitting down with him. Steve, if you could give me your elevator introduction, 30 seconds or less. I'm not sure if I know what that means. Uh, my name is Steve Anderson, <laughs> uh, probably best known as the dry fire guy, maybe the mental game guy. Uh, I made Grandmaster 15 years ago and about nine months after buying an open gun. And now my, my primary passion and my occupation is helping people get better with competition shooting. Okay. How's that? That sounds good. That's a good, that's a good lead in. Okay. So uh, this is a world of finite resources and finite time. For the guy who's just getting started and wants to get good, sees all the good uh, videos on YouTube, Instagram of people burning it down, but maybe just got their gun has gone to the range a couple times. What would be your advice to that guy as far as getting up to the next level? Well, first thing to do is pick a sport and then learn the sport. If, if, we, if we own a gun and we want to compete, I think a steel challenge match is the best place to go. Mm -hmm. They'll let you start low ready if you're new. And there may even be a non-holster division for some of these clubs. But find a steel challenge match and go to that. When you hear your bullet hit a steel target for the first time, you're going to be hooked forever. And then once you get comfortable with, with steel challenge, uh, then the next, the next logical choice would be probably IDPA or USPSA or something along those lines. Um, know going in that you are learning the sport. You know, don't expect to go there. I'm, so many people have been humbled, right? Absolutely. Uh, so many people shoot a little bit and they think, they think they're, they're special and then they go to a USPSA match and they get taken to school. Understand that you're learning the sport. Um, so I guess that's, that, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, go to a match. And, and what do you think their expectation should be when they go to a match like that? So for the first match, you've got three I can think of right away. Have fun, be safe, learn the sport. Maybe even not in that order, and maybe in proper order, be safe, have fun, learn the sport. Right. The, your goal, what I always tell new shooters at new matches is to, your goal for today is fire all of the shots required to finish the match. That's your goal for today, and that's yeah. going to predicate upon being safe and not getting sent home. Speed doesn't even enter into the equation yet, and yeah. nobody is going to remember how bad you were at your first match unless you manage to point the gun at yourself or somebody else. Correct. That's the only way you're going to stand out in memory. Yep. So, what about for the guys who have you know been shooting for years but are just getting kind of switched onto this and want to get better and take it more seriously? They've got the fundamentals to shoot, you know, 10, 15 yards at a sheet of paper can make all the hits. Where, where, where do they? Where do you think they need to be? So number one. Let's start the mental game early. Um, the, the sports are full of people who have, who have the skills, possess the skills, but something happens on match day and they can't perform. So we got to address that first. Um, once we have the mental game, and I can help you with that, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's also gave a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you're having mental game help, uh, mental game trouble, please contact me. Um, I've recently been certified by Lanny Basham to teach mental management. It's not a commercial, that's, a, that's an option you have, right? You can talk to a USPSA guy who did go to school for the mental game of shooting. 
Um, but let's figure out, let's, let's adjust the middle game. And let's learn how to practice. Um, if you're not dry firing, it depends what level of participation is, but if, if you're not dry firing at all, I'm going to question your level of participation because it's the easiest way to get better if you do it correctly. Okay. You, you touched on something there that people who are familiar with your podcast, but for uh, level of participation, um, if you could just kind of define what that is and how it ties to your expectation on yeah, what you go going for. Absolutely. So uh, there's probably many levels of participation, but I can think of a few really easy. Level of participation number one is, to, is learning the sport. Right. Okay. Level of participation number two is having fun competing on a semi-random basis. Sure. Very low expectation down there. In fact, none at all. Sure. Uh, then we get into wanting to be locally competitive. And then we get into wanting to be regionally competitive. And then we get into wanting to dominate the sport or be nationally competitive. And each one of those requires different levels of resources, time, money, all the rest of it. Sure. Um, but it's very important to know what your level of participation is because... We see a lot of people who say, oh, I just shoot for fun. Well, they still look at the scores, don't they? And they still get upset when they don't perform well, right? Right. So if it's truly have fun, then make that your goal. Hey, I had a great time today. What, what do you think about the people who say, I'm just here to compete with myself? I don't believe them most of the time. <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, but I suppose I was that way when I was competing a bunch. I mean, I wanted to win. Sure. That's not why I was there. Sure. I was there to be better than the last of me. Sure. And when you make that your goal, you wind up winning. So speaking to the middle game and kind of the process, one of the things that I realized in this advanced class with you is yesterday when we were just getting started, I was kind of uh, competing with the other knuckleheads who were roughly around my level in the thing. And when I was being competitive with them, I wasn't getting great results. I was, I was trying to beat them and I was not focusing on the process of actually beating them, keeping the focus on, on what was important. So. That was something you kind of touched on in this class, and that's probably a good segue into kind of your two classes that you have. Because Steve is a firearms trainer. He does go around the country, and he is going to be in a range near you soon if he's not already scheduled to be there. So you've got a, a – I don't even know the titles of the classes. So if you could talk about your two classes and what you – They offer. don't really have titles. Right now we're calling them standard and advanced. Um, the standard class presumes that we have some technique things to improve. Um, we, we do a dry fire, to, heck, we dry fire for two and a half hours in, in the standard class because it's so critical that people dry fire correctly. Sure. Um, there's, at le uh, there's at least three kinds of dry fire, maybe four. A lot of folks will be surprised to hear that. Um, but I, I feel like I did invent the modern dry fire method uh, 15 years ago. I'm pr pretty proud of that. The reason I know that I invented it is because if there had been a modern dry fire method, I would have bought it. <laughs> and I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. Sure. Um, but I, I put together, sorry, sorry, back to the uh, two classes. So standard class covers fundamental technique. Right. That needs to be understood. Um, we talk about how to do transitions. We talk about the principles of movement. Um, one of the things you learn from today is I don't sell technique. I sell principles. Because if we can identify a principle, we can use any number of techniques to get there. Sure. And they may be different per shooter. They'll for sure be different per situation. And have you ever seen somebody learn? Oh, oh, you know, I'll give you a great example. When when the drop step first came out, yeah, we saw guys start here, want to go that way, and run all the way over here so they get their foot out of the fault line and do their drop step. Well, that's that's not a great application of a really good technique. Sure. So I, I try to focus on principles. Sure. Uh, so standard class, uh, more technique. You probably. At the beginning of this advanced class, I told you I'm here to teach you how to practice, teach you how to compete. We didn't break a lot of new ground with, with technical skills, did we? No, not really. And did I ever say you must do this this way? No, no. I never did. In, in fact, you were flexible on a couple different points. There was one point in the class, it was a uh, easy exit on a uh, thing that we were doing. And you're like, there's two techniques that I've seen be successful on this. This is what I do, and this is what you do. And each shooter had to kind of prove it out to themselves, which of those techniques worked better for them and got the best results and the answer wasn't by any means universal everybody right. had something different when i watch the super squad i see 16 guys doing 16 different things and they all work great but what they're always doing is they're shooting sooner they're uh they're leaving sooner they're shooting sooner and they're shooting more often sure <laughs> sure absolutely shooting more frequently sure so the, in, in in the internet age i realize you were kind of a different age it was all dial up probably back in the day when you were getting started in this it was i i, I uh 
there was no YouTube. Yeah. There was no match video. There was no Instagram. If you wanted to see a grandmaster, you had to go to nationals. Sure. So I guess my question is kind of, it, it seems really easy to sit back and watch a lot of the information on YouTube, watch people on Instagram. There are obviously a bunch of resources out there. You've written several books yourself. Um, how would you kind of, if for the person who's trying to improve themselves, how would you how would you recommend kind of navigating that area? Because there's a lot of competing voices, and I see a lot of people who even contact me on my channel who try and put like four or five different grip videos together that are not really meant to go together, and they're not getting great <laughs> results. So, how would you speak to that? Uh, find somebody that you trust and do exactly what they tell you to do, and pick one person. Pick one person that you trust and do exactly what they tell you to do. Because if, if, if we go, so let's say we're, we're an intermediate shooter and we reach out to six different instructors. Well, you're going to get six different versions of pretty much the same stuff, right? Mm -hmm. One of those approaches will feel right to you. Sure. Others will feel forced or, or they'll feel not natural. And you, you may have to do some things that are not natural, but, but finding somebody that speaks your language is, is, is critical. That sounds good. That sounds good. And as far as equipment's concerned, a lot of people seem to want to blame it on the guns, saying like, well, yeah, of course he can do that. He's shooting powder puff loads with a whatever whiz-bang gun. What's, what's your feeling on equipment? I'll tell you, the most important thing about a competition firearm is it has to work. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, it has to have good sights has to have a good trigger, but most important thing is reliability. Sure. I've seen so many expensive guns in classes that just don't work. Um, so your gun has to work, and you have to have confidence in it. I believe confidence is at least 30% of success. So in 2020 right now, would you say that there is one firearm you absolutely have to buy to be competitive in? We'll just use carry optics because that's the class right now. Is okay. there one that you have to use to be competitive? Yes, there is. Oh, yeah, and which one is that? One that inspires you to practice. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a very good answer. I thought Sid, Steve is a SIG guy, and I thought for sure he was going to drop the Legion on us, but uh, he, he gave what I feel is the correct answer. So <laughs> one, one of the favorite things I, I hear from people is, man, I got this new gun. And man, I'm shooting better than I ever have. I love this thing so much, I don't ever put it down. I'm dry firing more, I'm live, and now we're getting, well, we're finding out yeah. why it works. Um, typically, the more money we spend, the better we think we've solved the problem. It's true in cars, it's, sure. oh, absolutely. It's, it's true in medical treatment. Guitars? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Are you a guitar guy? I, I, I used to be, but since kids, I put the guitars down. Oh, I got but. you. So, <laughs> so I used to, I, I'm a big guitar guy too. And uh, anytime I get a new, a new guitar, I play better. Oh Cause yeah. Cause I, Cause I don't put it down. It's like a kid who runs faster with new shoes. Correct. It inspires <laughs> me to practice. Are you saying that's, that's right. not real when we got new shoes and went for a run? That was the first no, thing we no, did. No, son, you're absolutely faster at oh, jumping higher. Oh man, I've been, sure. been lied to my whole life. <laughs> Well, let's talk about some of your material. So you've got three books written, uh, Refinement and Repetition. Uh, the second book, I, that name escapes me. Principles of Performance. Principles of Performance. And um, the third book is Get to Work. Yep. So give me a brief synopsis of what's in each one of those. No problem. Is. So Refinement and Repetition, uh, the backbone of that book is the 12 drills I used to become a USPSA Grandmaster in about nine months. Um, at that time, the classifiers that we saw frequently were very simple. Most of them were shoot something six times, reload, shoot something six times. So I simply realized, hey, if I can shoot really quickly, uh, six shots, accurate shots, reload and shoot six more accurate shots, I can become a grandmaster. For sure. Um, and so I, d I took those skills and turned them into 12 drills, and I did them for two to four hours a night. And then once I made grandmaster, I was the first grandmaster in Ohio, and people kept saying, how'd you do it? How'd you do it? Well, I got these 12 drills. They were on one piece of paper and I just give it to them. And I did that about 30 times and I realized I should be, I should not be giving this away. There's, there's value <laughs> here. So somebody watching this may have a copy of Refinement Repetition that I made myself at Kinko's. Remember Kinko's? Oh yeah, yeah. I'd go to Kinko's at night and I'd, I'd make the books myself and I'd ship them out. So Refinement Repetition is, I think there's 28 drills in there. The first 12 are my 12 commandments of dry fire. Sure. There's not a lot of technical advice in that book because I didn't feel, I didn't feel qualified to give technical advice. There's a little bit. Sure. Uh, principles of performance is, hey, I'm a grandmaster and I'm having trouble. <laughs> that's, that's the introduction of the mental game. And that's me showing you 
the experiences that I had as a grandmaster trying to get better match performance, both technically and, and mentally. Mm -hmm. It also has a great interview I did with Lanny Basham, uh, is in Principles of Performance. And then later, Get to Work, I wrote, where everything in shooting starts out real simple, right? Hit the target. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Then it gets really complicated. And my desire was to get us back to hit the target. I know that sounds overly simplistic. Sure. But if you'll, if you'll think about what we talked about today, uh, or yesterday rather, when we were when we doing our sample stages, anytime you had more than one thing on your mind, yeah. you were more likely to struggle. Yeah. Anytime you had one thing on your mind, you were far more likely to be successful. So, so get to work says, hey, these things are very important and you should work on them. On match day, you need to forget about all of them. Sure. And that sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? It does. You yeah. tell me to forget about all this stuff I practice? Yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you to do. Yeah. Just forget it all. Some of it is counterintuitive. We shot groups today as part of the class. And <laughs> I love this. Steve's, I love group shooting. Steve's technique for group shooting, uh, he basically breaks you down and then builds you back up. And it is nonsensical, especially in the age of dots, because when you're doing it his way, the dot is all over the target. But the group is itty bitty if you just do what he says so Actually, everybody improve their groups i got that from brian enos that that's not my discovery i was just like you i was trying to zero zero my open gun brian enos said you don't need a rest so i'm not going to use a rest and uh terrible groups and then brian enos has has three principles i almost don't even want to say them because nobody will even believe it <laughs> let's let's just suffice to say that it doesn't matter how much your gun is shaking if you want to get a great group. That's probably sure. going to get me some, some work right there. For sure. There you go. And uh, last thing, and then we can uh, get on the way. Uh, for the person who is trying to get better, I've, I've encountered through talking to people in comments, working with people on the range. For the person who you, you tell them what or how to do a technique, but they counter with why they can't do it, what would your advice to them be? Golly. Um, that usually happens when people are trying to accomplish two things at once. And if we, if we understand that we're only sh short term going to improve one thing at a time, so much frustration goes away. Uh, shooters are notorious for yabbits. You know what a yabbit yeah, is? Yeah. yeah, but. Yeah. Hey, man, that was a smoke and draw. Yeah, but it was a delta. Yeah. Hey, man, you ran that in two seconds. Yeah, but it had a mic. So we have to define success narrowly. That'll solve most of the problems. Okay. Um, but most shooters aren't willing to do that. Okay. And like, if you were over here indulging in what I call speed mode practice. Sure. Remember that little four target stage? Yeah, yeah. Remember the guest shooter that, that came over? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, if, if, if a group of people were watching you do that and get faster and faster and faster, they can't wait until you shoot a mic or a delta. They can't wait. Because they're going to go, man, he was fast, but yeah. got to get rid of the butt. Now, to, to indulge in practice like that requires you to have a strong match mode. Because we, you would, I would never encourage you to compete like we were shooting that. Yeah, for but sure. But until you do that, you don't know what you're capable of. Yeah. And if you do it enough, it becomes normal. Right. And then it becomes automatic. And then you can't do anything else. Then when you put your match mode hat back on, you say, okay. I've been practicing speed for a month. I know I'm getting faster. I feel great about that. Today, I'm going to leave only acceptable shots. Notice I didn't say slow down. Yeah. Leaving only acceptable shots will put you at the correct speed. And you experience that over and over yeah. and over again. Actually, that, that makes me want to hit on one more thing. Um, you're very big on kind of experiential and experimental learning and not just like follow. The, if you do all this, I mean, the refinement and repetition, yes. If you, if you put in dedicated work and you understand how to work down par times and economy of motion and efficiency you're going to get faster but i had a breakthrough today on that easy exit technique that i didn't consciously figure out it was basically an array of three targets an array of three targets and two boxes and the two techniques that we talked about i tried one of the techniques and my body just picked up my foot and put it in the air on the second target and then i started falling out of the position on the third target as we exited and my time immediately dropped by i don't know it's two or three tenths but it was very it's very significant. So, um, wh wh where where does the experiential thing and how does somebody who is already practicing kind of work that into their practice? So, one of the things that I hate the most are people arguing about techniques. And what I hate even more than that is arguing with other instructors about techniques. 
via their shooters. Sure. You know, everybody's got their favorite guy. I want to be your favorite guy. But everybody's got <laughs> He's their a favorite. nice guy, in fairness. <laughs> everybody's, everybody's got their favorite guy. Oh, my guy says this. Or my guy says that. Well, I use... You, it's, just, it's the craziest thing in the world. I use a timer to tell me when people are doing things correctly. Sure. If the time is dropping, we're doing it correctly. If the time is not dropping, something needs to be addressed. If, if we hit a plateau, maybe we've reached a limit of human function. Maybe we haven't. But... We, we need we, we need to try everything we can think of, and that's why I like principles better than techniques. Techniques will evolve over time. They didn't have the drop step 30 years ago. Sure. 10 years from now, they may have something better, but the principle is going to be the same. No. The principles no. don't change. Absolutely. Leave sooner, shoot sooner, uh, shoot as soon as you can, avoid stopping shooting. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. these principles don't change. Yeah, and, until they change the way that the sport is scored, the principles are going to be same yeah and all the technique does uh is help you employ those principles for sure that's all it does sounds real good all well, right thanks. man well, i think we got it i appreciate okay. your time thank you so much have a great yes, day yes sir you too and it, so we're the first thing we're going to do is very briefly go over moving dry fire because everybody knows the 12 drills right um those 12 drills will make you a grandmaster if you do them enough they will it's a mathematical certainty there are some number of repetitions that you need to do of those 12 drills to make Grandmaster, and then it'll, it'll just happen. Um, if, if that's your goal, then you need to do more reps. If your goal is to get to B class or C class or wherever you want to go, those repetitions will provide that. And it's just a number of reps. It's just math. You know, my, my strong recommendation is that you carve out 36 to 48 minutes a day. Guys, we waste that amount of time on our phones times three every day. You know, every time you refresh Facebook, it could be five draws you're done. One will make you a better shooter, one will not. And I'm, I'm guilty as anybody else. My addiction is words with friends. I could spend three hours playing words with friends. And I love it. But what have I accomplished at the end of it? Not much. So, um, we, I don't think we need to cover standing dry fire, but I do want to cover moving dry fire, and I do want to cover mass mode dry fire very briefly, just so that we understand. Now, the stronger your match mode is, the more work you want to do in speed mode, okay? The weaker your match mode is, or unreliable, immature, then the more work you want to do in match mode. But a lot of folks don't understand what that means. So, do you remember yesterday when we did the uh, Delta Disqualifier exercises? That's how I want you to shoot matches, okay? Because if, if you go out and tell yourself only alphas, it's going to slow you down. But if you tell yourself, it's a, we have to define what an acceptable shot is. And then your shot calling is just pass fail. It's either acceptable or it's not. And for most people, it's going to be an alpha or a close charlie. Nobody ever wants to, wants to shoot a charlie on a close target, but it's going to happen. And if you resolve to shoot only alphas, you're going to go in there with a scalpel and, a, and, a, uh, and, a, and an hourglass, right? But if we say, hey, alpha close charlie is cool, you monitor for that. And then your shot calling, you might get a yellow light every now and then, yeah. but it wasn't a red light, it was a yellow light. That one wasn't great, but it's probably okay. But if you ever get a red light in your shot calling, that's when you've got to go back and correct it, if you can. You know, if you've left the position, you're probably better off leaving it. Um, without getting into the math, there's probably, a, there's probably a hit factor where you could go back. I would guess below five, maybe you could go back, but it depends how far away you are. But if you, if you monitor that gun as it goes off, you know, your shot coin's either green, yellow, or red. <laughs> green, great, yellow, uh, red, fix it. Okay, so let's, let's go address moving dry fire first. What can I do? The best thing you can do for travel, number one, if you can't take a gun, give yourself a pass. Don't beat yourself up over it. Don't sit there and go, oh, I'm traveling, I can't practice, I'm a big failure. If you're stuck, you're stuck. What you can do is take a bottle of water and shoot while you're moving in your hotel room. If you want to, watch that. Watch the water in that bottle tell you how stable you are. Okay? No, I did that. At you lunch, did? I did that at lunchtime, like, for two weeks in a row. It helped, didn't it? Yeah, it did. You stand by. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. Most people it needs to become automatic <laughs> for most people right some kind of contribution to leaving is required Woo. 
Good job shooting soon. Too flat. Well, I noticed something and I don't know. Time? 185. You can call your miss, I'd like you to make it up. If it's a dirt makeup, you can still make it up if you want to, but you may be past the line. If you get past the line, don't shoot. Okay? Make it up. Stand by. One, six, nine.